Okay, here we go. So today might be a rather extended lecture. I want to cover up to the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's what I was able to achieve with my morning students, although they had two hours of suffering. So integration should remind you of two things. The one thing is sum. This S sign is for summa, for sum. And what are we summing? That's the second thing we should remember. Would anybody tell me, what are we summing, please? Exactly, Brandon. The areas of the mini rectangles under the curve. So if the curve is continuous, uh, the, if, if I make the rectangles thin enough, anywhere within the rectangle, I can erect the elevation. So f of x dx represents the uh, area of the thin rectangles. Now, if you understand that many of the properties become immediately clear, all we're doing is just summing. So here are some examples and let's see if you are capable of doing it without my help first. Uh, can you evaluate the integrals below? A, let's begin with A and figure out what's the value without doing any complicated calculation. Just looking at it and saying, ah, I know exactly what it equals to. In other words, evaluate the integral as fast as you possibly can. So uh, Brandon, you say A is equal to one, correct? So your claim is A equals to the number one. Okay, thank you. Your response is noted. What about the rest of you guys? What do you think? What's this integral equal to? Come on guys, very fast, think fast. You're on what when we are show. Well, the question then simply is, what are we integrating? So Christian says one half, but you see before you, you throw numbers, what are we integrating? What is this curve? So let's now view it all together. So let's say y equals to root of one minus x squared. So this is my skyline, right? This root of, um, this root of one minus x squared is my skyline. Right, for the, for the very thin uh, skyscrapers, the rectangles there. What is that skyline like? So I say y equal to root of, of one minus x squared. So then if I square it, I see, aha, uh -huh, y squared is one minus x squared or x squared plus y squared equal to one. Now, would anybody tell me what is x squared plus y squared equal one? What sort of curve is that describing? Hello, Pavel. Nice to see you. Hello. What sort of curve is this skyline describing? X squared plus Y squared is what? It is a... A what? 
Why are the answers not streaming? X squared plus Y squared equal to one is what sort of curve? A circle. And in particular here, look at it. The integration is happening from zero to one. So that means what? That means X is restricted to be between uh, zero and one and y is positive because I don't have the plus minus here. Y is positive. So in particular, the region I'm integrating is one quarter of the unit circle. You understand? It's one quarter of the unit circle because I realize uh, what are, I'm integrating, I can possibly avoid, sidestep the process and figure out without doing any work. So the answer is one quarter the area of a unit circle, which is one quarter pi. This integral is one quarter pi. Now, let's see if you can fare a little bit better in B. What's the integral from zero to three of X minus one DX, right? I can break it apart, you see, because integration is like summation here. I can distribute the DX to X and to the minus one, and I can write it as the integral from zero to three of X DX minus uh, the integral of one DX, agreed? So it's, because it's, again, remember, this is like addition. Addition of what? Of those rectangles. Now I can always multiply the width through and, and make it uh, whatever addition I like. So quickly, can you figure out what's this area without doing any, any, calcula any complicated calculations? You have one minute. Pavel, uh, that's not integration question. But what do you, <laughs> what do you, what do you uh, mean when we make an account for the math site? What ID do we use? Well, you write your name. You have this. If you have you seen my latest email? My latest email came today. Just I try to summarize again the same I, the same things. Make sure to register as quickly as possible. Maybe today. Uh, so what you register is, uh, is what's on my email. Do you, do you, do you receive my email, Pavel? Did you receive my email? Uh, it says what to do to register. Yeah. So over there, it says, I think Atkin and uh, whatever code you need for registration. So you set up your account, you put your first and last name in the account and you register using that ID. Good. Now, guys, one minute. Actually, it's already more than that. Fast. Should I hurry you? What's this integral quickly? It's already two minutes past. Okay, then let's do it together. Okay, Christian, noted. Let's do it together. We can separate it into integral from zero to three of X DX and the integral from zero to three of minus one DX. And I can recognize those shapes, right? What is that shape? It's a triangle because the skyline is Y equal to X. Are you with me? skyline of those small rectangles is y equals x and i integrated from zero to three so really when i stack those rectangles i'm finding the area of a triangle of width three and height three so the area is nine over two now now if i integrate minus one it means that uh, i have a horizontal line at minus one so that's a negative area it's uh, three multiplied by minus one or minus three. So the answer is Christian, congratulations, three halves. 
Now, final question, number C. Can you do it quickly, please? Question number C, integral from minus three to three of root of nine minus x squared plus x plus two without doing any complicated calculations. Just look at it and say, what's the answer? What should be the answer, please? Okay, Alan, thank you. Be careful, think about, can it be five? Well, think about it carefully. All right, I guess not. Then we'll do it together. Chag Hanukkah Sameach, Minkowski. Yes, to you too, Alan. I'm glad you didn't decided not to skip uh, this very joyful um, event. Right? It's a, it would be like, like the Hanukkah uh, celebration. Uh, it's like a math course that uh, uh, was supposed to be short, but will last for a lifetime. Right? For eight years instead of one semester. So here is how we solve this particular problem. We can break it apart into the integral of root nine minus x squared. And what is that from minus three to three? It is half of a circle of radius three. So its area is nine pi over two. The integral from minus three to three of x, it can be broken into positive and negative area. They cancel each other to zero, so it doesn't matter. And the integral of two, it's just uh, the area of a rectangle of width from minus three to three or width six and altitude two. So its area is 12. So the answer is nine pi over two plus 12. Good. Here is yet another short uh, question. If it is known that the integral from zero to 10 of f of x dx is 17 and the integral from zero to eight of the function is 12, what is the integral from eight to 10 please? Five. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Alan. So the answer is obvious. Yes, Christian. The answer is obvious because what can we do? We can say that the integral from eight to 10 is just the integral from zero to 10 minus the integral from zero to eight. They cancel. And that would be 17 minus 12 or five. Okay, so there are going to be other properties, you see, from 9 to 13, I mentioned a few other hopefully interesting ideas about uh, calculus. I explained to you 
um, something about uh, volume in terms of area, right? Of the, uh, the uh, let's say, how do I know um, what's the area of the circle if I know the, um, what's the, what's the area contained within the circle to be precise, if I know the length of the circumference of the circle. And uh, about pyramids, that, that is kind of good for Passover, but if we are not celebrating Passover right now, we can still think of it, okay? So I'm going to, going to and then there is of course con, cones, where I explain how you obtain the volume of cones, but let's move on to the next lecture here. Integral shortcuts, okay? So what were you doing uh, when you were uh, carrying out integration? So for, ex for instance, suppose you want to integrate uh, from zero to two of three x squared dx. So the procedure for finding this definite integral would be to write a uh, right-hand rule, Riemann sum, and take the limit. Here I carry it through. I hope you know how to write the Riemann sum limits. It's, all, it's the most useful thing I can teach you if you are going anywhere with mathematics. Just yesterday I was do, uh, deriving some results in probability theory. Very important results about the beta distribution. So this integral is usually solved through the studium of Riemann sums and taking their limits. Now, there is going to be another process, right? That I will uh, show you right now what it is. And uh, that involves taking antiderivatives. You see that this integral, the definite integral and the indefinite integral have the same appearance. Now the definite integral, it's clear why we have this representation because the definite integral refers to summing up the areas of the thin rectangles. Whereas the antiderivative, uh, the indefinite integral refers to finding antiderivative of the function. Now uh, what the link between them, the link between them is that if I can find a function whose derivative is uh, the integrand, then all I have to do is evaluate uh, that um, antiderivative function at the point B and subtract the antiderivative of the function at the point A. So for example, uh, if I want to evaluate the integral from zero to two of three uh, X squared, if I can guess the antiderivative of three X squared, which I can, the antiderivative is X cubed. All I have to do to obtain the area is plug two into that antiderivative and subtract plugging zero into that antiderivative. So it's two cubed minus zero cubed, which is eight. Look at it. I obtain eight much quicker than doing this uh, tedious process of Riemann sums. You see, this is doing it uh, by definition, by Riemann sums, I obtain eight. And here I uh, have this trick. I will explain why it works later. And I obtain eight, good. So let's practice applying this trick for uh, a few minutes, okay? So use this uh, technique. All you have to do is guess an antiderivative and then write this bar with top number and bottom number, which means plug in top number, subtract plug in bottom number. What's the, what's the integral in A using the shortcut? How would you solve it? You have uh, exactly one minute.
right? Your minute is over. What's, what's an antiderivative for x cubed minus 2x? Can you guess one? So it would be what? It would be x to the power of one quarter, sorry, to the power of four, not one quarter, to the power of four times one quarter minus x squared. And I evaluate this function from minus one to two, which means I plug two and subtract the value at one. Let's see what, what is that going to look like. Okay, thank you, Christian. What is that going to look like? Well, here it is, guys. A, uh, I, I evaluate at uh, two and minus one, and uh, what I end up having is three quarters, because look at it, I plug in two. Are you with me, guys? I plug in two, subtract, I, I have the same expression where I plug minus one. And when I carry the algebra, I get three quarters. Do you understand? Let's try the next problem. B. Yes, Christian, no problem. Uh, so integral from one to nine of root of uh, X, please. What do you do now? You have one minute. Is today Groundhog's Day? Why most of you are hiding? I don't see your pretty faces. Due to, you mean, Alisa, to Hanukkah? Yes. Yod imatem lichvod ma, lichvod ha Hanukkah. We can sing a few songs if you want. Okay, so uh, let's move on, guys. What do we say? So the you see, I was I was expecting a, a solution to this question, and I do not see it. It's, it's three minutes already. So what is this function? It's x to the one half. What is an antiderivative of it? It is x to the three halves times two thirds evaluated from one to nine, which means I plug nine subtract and I plug in one. Thank you, Alan. So here it is. I plug in nine and I plug in one and I have 18 minus two thirds. Are you with me? 18, uh, Alan, I think you typed 81. Uh, I think you meant 18. We are, we are not in Hebrew school. So 18 minus two thirds. Now the next question is, good. C, what is the answer to C? You have one minute.
and the minute is passed, what do we do? We write uh, this as four minus t times t to the one half. We distribute the t to the one half, getting integral from zero to four of four t to the one half minus t to the three halves. Okay, thank you, James. And so what do I get? I plug in, uh, I have this expression and in, into this expression, I plug in four and I subtract uh, uh, this expression evaluated at zero. At zero, naturally, it doesn't matter. So only plug in four. So it ends up being what? It ends up being um, 64 over three minus 64 over five. Good. Yes, Alan, good. Next question. D, you have one minute. Thank you, Alan. Good, Christian. So, minute is passed. What is the antiderivative of secant tangent, please? Wait, wait I got a question. I'm sorry. Um, so, I know, I know, um, I know with the the um with the derivative of secant right if you put it into a circle right with the triangle it's gonna give you um if i'm right uh the fraction of um it's either one over one one over um the square root of two if i'm if i'm going crazy right so well, how uh, do you at pi over four? So uh, all you remember yeah. is the triangle, right? So uh, so here is uh, the pi over four triangle. Yeah. Uh, remember how we can obtain it. So one nice tri uh, one nice triangle over is, four. is pi over four. I mean, then this is pi over four. Okay. If you set this equal to one, this equal to one, and, and that's, that's half of a square. So that would be root two. You see, because I just yeah. cut a, a unit square in half. That's why it's pi over four. That's why it's easy to obtain. Okay. So now, what is uh, secant of pi over four? It means uh, hypotenuse over adjacent, which makes it root two. Okay, but we get um, minus negative one. Uh, sorry. Answer. Like the answer uh -huh. is yeah. because you need to subtract zero. So uh, be, you see, so what you have is is you need to evaluate secant of zero. So this would be what? This would be. Uh, the antiderivative here is secant of theta, you agree? And secant of theta must be evaluated from zero to pi over four. So my answer is secant of pi over four minus secant of zero. Now secant of zero is, uh, it, it's one over cosine of zero, which is one. So what I have is root two minus one. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Because you, you take the top number into the antiderivative minus the bottom number in the antiderivative. Good? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next question is E, guys. You have to do it very fast. One minute. Very good, Christian. Very good, Alan. If you are finished with one question, use the time to solve the remaining ones.
Oh, good. One. Okay. Thank you, Alan. All right, so the minute is passed, so we need to solve it. We need to write, what's the antiderivative of secant squared? I just know it's tangent. So it's tangent of t evaluated from zero to pi over four. So that is tangent at pi over four is one, tangent of zero is zero. So the answer is simply one for e. You all understand? Confirm if you want, if you understand, please. I need to see lots of confirmations. If you follow how to use this uh, trick. Three people, why not more? And if you don't understand, then uh, ask me a question. Yeah, of course, Christian. I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask another question. So with the tangent, right? Um knowing that um knowing that um tangent t knowing that you, you plug in um t you plug in t for pi over four, right? So in order to do that, right, you do tangent equals um what's this um what sine over cosine, right? So you get or, or the, you can draw yourself the same triangle. So tangent is opposite over adjacent, you're right, but you can okay. say opposite over adjacent. So if this is root two. Uh, this is pi over four, and this is one and one. So ratio is uh, one divided by one. Okay, that's fine. All right, so you can do that. Yes, very good. And All a right. tangent of zero is zero. You see that as well, right? Yeah. Good. So that's why I, I just try, wrote right away one. But it's tangent of pi over four minus tangent of zero. And tangent of zero just happens to be zero. Good? Yeah. Good. Okay. Now we do F. One minute. All right, 20 seconds. Okay, good, Christian. Okay, are we ready? So very simply, we divide by V uh, to the four and what do we get? We get the integral from one to two of one over V plus three V squared DV, which as an antiderivative, this is a ln of absolute value of V plus V cubed evaluated from one to two. 
if you plug in two into this expression, so you get a ln of uh, two plus eight. And then I need to plug in one. Now a ln of one is zero and uh, uh, V cubed of one is one. So it's minus one. So the answer is ln two plus seven. You see guys? So this should take you one minute, no more. Why minus one? Because I subtract this expression at one. So if this is, uh, let's say K of V, then I evaluate K of two minus K of one. So this minus one is, this is, is a ln of one and uh, uh, one cubed and I subtract that. All right, uh, Alisa. All right, celebrate. Take care. Hopefully there'll be a miracle. Yes, you subtract between the endpoints of the intervals, Christian, precisely. It's top minus bottom, good. So I'm gonna clear this board. Now your goal is to evaluate uh, this function. That's I suppose is G, so integrate this, you have one minute. You don't have to always finish the full calculation, but you should with very fast recognize uh, what's the antiderivative here. What is the antiderivative here? Minute is over. James, the answer cannot contain X. Antiderivative is what? So maybe you wanted to say the antiderivative simply. So look at this expression. This is eight times one over one plus X squared. What will produce one over one plus X squared when I take derivative? It is a Exactly, this is, uh, so the, the answer is, this is eight tangent inverse X evaluated from one over root three to root three. And what do I get? Well, I can recognize this from the, uh, this triangle. I have the triangle with uh, pi over three, one half, root three over two and one, right? So, and this would be pi over six. So I can see that tangent of pi over three is root three. So uh, that would be pi over three minus uh, tangent inverse of one over root three, it would be pi over six. You see why? Because tangent of pi over six, it's gonna be one over root three. 
So it's pi over three minus pi over six, which is simply pi over six as my answer. So this you have to do fast. You can practice after, afterwards if you like. Now, final question of this type is integral from minus two to two of f of x dx, where um, the function is piecewise. It's two for uh, values between minus two and zero and four minus x squared from zero to two. What is the integral? All right, time is up. Very simply, you break up the integral from minus two to zero and from zero to two, because uh, you see between uh, zero, zero is that point where formulas are changed. So then between minus two and zero, I integrate two. And between zero and two, I integrate four minus x squared. I find uh, this integral easily, it's just two multiplied by two. I can do it geometrically. This integral I can write as, I can find the antiderivative to be four X minus one third X cubed from zero to two. And my answer is 12 minus eight over three. Now help me please with one more integral. Could you please tell me what's the integral from minus one to one of one over X squared? Of course, if you need to, you remember this is just X to the power of minus two, correct? Please tell me what's the integral.
Okay, some people began answering. Okay, James says two. Thank you, James. Rachel, you say two. Okay. What about the rest of you guys? Did you check out already? Semester is over. Christian got zero. All right, let's. So uh, uh, let's say let's say let's do it then together. I suppose if it takes so long. So uh, what about doing this uh, integral, right? So what's the antiderivative of x to the uh, one over x squared? It's minus x to the minus one. Do you agree? How many of you got that? The antiderivative of uh, x to the power of minus two is minus x to the minus one. Please confirm. Show me signs of life. Thank you, James. Okay, Alan, thank you. So uh, I think so. What about the rest of you? Come on guys, you see I'm squeezing my last minutes here and you are not trying to help me. You're just sitting there. Okay. And what about you, Zohib? What about you, Yixin? What about you, Jun? Right, what about you, Heidi? Alan Wang, what about you guys? Why uh, I don't hear from you, Brandon? What's your ideas? So then we can apply this formula, and what do we get? Look at it, we get uh, that it's the integral of minus x to the minus one evaluated from minus one to one, correct. So I plug in, I, I can factor out this minus and I plug in one to the minus one and subtract plugging in minus one to the power of minus one. What do we get in the parentheses? It is one minus minus one, which is one plus one. So I get minus two. I get minus two, yes? Does the result make sense? Does the result make sense, guys? Alan does, okay, what about the rest of you? Yes, Christian. Can it be negative, Brandon? Interesting question. Well, I, th I would say the result makes as much sense as the lockdown measures. So, could it be negative? No, it doesn't seem like it. Or maybe it could. I mean, there are, uh, mathematics is very, uh, very uh, strange. But look at it. Uh, it does not seem that I'm gathering negative area. It seems that I have positive area. So this result is not. Uh, um, well, we cannot apply it just without thinking this guessing game, right? This uh, this shortcut. Maybe the shortcut doesn't work. Now, now let's investigate what made the shortcut work. Okay, let's investigate what makes the shortcut work. And uh, we need to develop this idea. Listen carefully, guys. Now, do you know what is a, a lens over there, right? So imagine that you are trying to measure how deep is the ocean, or uh, you want to measure how deep must you dig through the ground until you hit bedrock. Our bedrock is the x-axis. Would anybody tell me how would they uh, carry out this procedure? So here you have this one-dimensional um, landscape and you have to survey the, and measure the average distance to the bedrock. How would you go about and do that? You're tired, Alan? I see your, your joke, of course, that's good. So, how do you find the average distance to the bedrock? How would you do that? Any ideas? No, the joke is good, fine.
don't you take the average of different heights? Yeah, so how would I measure the height? So you are a land surveyor. You were tasked to estimate the average uh, elevation of this landscape. How would you carry out uh, this process? That's my question. Well, why not sample uh, points along the way, right? Why not take this point and maybe this point and maybe this point and maybe this point and maybe this point and that 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 point, right? Maybe B is the last point here, right? So you see that I have, I, I have lots of uh, line segments that uh, I can add up their lengths. They are all equidistant on the x-axis. And I add their lengths and divide by the total number of uh, length, uh, segments that I've added. You understand what I'm what I'm saying, guys? So, for instance, let's let's try to approximate this average by taking a, n measurements. So there are going to be point x1, x2, all the way to xn. There are n points at which I take my measurement. So, uh, so that so how am I going to describe point x1 at which I take the measure? So I will say it's it just go from point A, displaced by one um, block by one distance, B minus A over N is one distance. And then take the sample point, evaluate F at that point. And then displace uh, two blocks and take a measurement. Displace from a N blocks and take the measurement. Are you with me? Yes, you take the measurements, you add up the heights and you, and you divide by N. So in other words, uh, I suggest we, we have one over N summation, K one to N, F of K multiplied by B minus A over N. Are you getting this formula, guys? Yes? And so it is reasonable that if I uh, make the separation between uh, successive points very small, my average will actually converge to the average height of the function, the average height of the landscape. Do you see that? If the function is continuous. Because uh, what, what it means is that I sample nearby points and continuity has this property that uh, between uh, two lines that are close together or all altitudes are very similar. Do you understand? I, I hear eerie silence. So I, when I hear eerie silence, by default, I assume you do not understand. Now, this is the average. Let, let's see. This is the average. I take the limit as n goes to infinity, summation from k1 uh, to n. And I can move in the 1 over n. I multiply. Does this look familiar? Look at this expression. Does this look like something we were doing? Albeit for a short time, does this look like something we were doing? What does it remind you of? In your comments, what does it remind you of? What are we summing up? It looks like what we are summing up are or what? I'm hoping that what we are summing up is not the, the total disappointment. What are we summing up? This looks like a Riemann sum. Look at it. If it were B minus A, this entire expression would look like Like what? Like an integral. You see, look at it. That's what, how we evaluated integrals. It would look like the integral from a to b f of x dx multiplied by the length of that interval. Yes? Do you understand, guys? That's how you, yeah, that's how you develop such formulas. You see, you wanted to find the average and you realize that for continuous functions, the average should be uh, 1 over b minus a integral from a b f of x dx. 
let's see if we understand that idea. Without doing any calculations, let's see, can you do that guys? Without any calculations, determine the limit A as H goes to zero of one over H integral from zero to H X squared plus two DX. What is that limit without any calculation? You look at it and you know the answer, which is what? Okay, Nassim, uh, thank you. You say plus infinity. What, uh, what, what, you see this limit, what is it equal to? That's the question. Any, anybody else? So before you go about, uh, you know, how do you, how do I calculate it? I look at it and I say, what is it? What is somebody trying to figure out? What is somebody trying to figure out? Look at it. Uh, the length of the interval is H and I divide by H. So this means that somebody is trying to survey the average elevation on the graph. So this is what I immediately see. I see the landscape, the landscape at zero is two and I have this uh, parabola. Right, And so I do that where H is very close to zero. So I'm surveying the average height of this function where H is moving in close to zero. Yes? And what do you think happens uh, when uh, I carry out this uh, surveillance? Look at it. What do you think is going to be the average? The function is continuous, right? X squared plus two is continuous. So what do you think is going to be the average uh, over a very, very short interval? You just said that you understood uh, this formula. It, it what is the, what the elevation is close to zero? Will the average be close to zero? Or you mean X is close to zero? It is a very, very ambiguous word. Um, what is the average? I would say the average would be close to zero. Yeah, okay, the average altitude. So you stand over here. What are the altitudes in this region? The altitude in this region is roughly what number? Um, H. No, H is meaningless. There's no H. H just means that we open up an interval and we take oh, no. the average. We open another interval, we take an average. And that interval over which we take the average is approaching zero. The, the, there is no such thing as H. You understand? It's just a way to communicate. What am I really saying here is this. I'm surveying a landscape where the a skyline of that landscape is X squared plus two. And I'm averaging this altitude uh, for uh, values very close to zero. 
over an interval very close to zero. Closer and closer to zero, what that average is going to approach. Do you see, look at this landscape, I even drew it to you. You see, over, over a large interval, there is much difference in the landscape. But once I approach, uh, let's say the point zero, this landscape is essentially of the same elevation. So the average will be essentially the same. What will that be, that value of the average? Two, precisely, the average is two. Do you all see that? Guys, so two things here. Do you understand how I developed this integral formula that, and I say it indicates the average? But I don't have to use the integration to figure it out because I, I see that if h is going to close to zero, then I'm averaging values that uh, of, of altitude for x close to zero. The function is continuous. So all the altitudes are essentially the same altitude, namely very close to zero squared plus two or, or two. Thank you, James. And thank you, um, and thank you, Nassim. So, next question. Let's see if you can do it faster. B. What is this limit? Look at it. My function is defined to be sine x over x if x is not zero, and one if x is zero. What is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of one over h integral from zero to h f of x dx? What's going to be that average? Okay, Nassim, that's interesting. Very good. And, and in particular, it equals to? That's right. Okay. Okay, good, Rachel, good, it's one. The answer is one. Agreed? Do you see why it's one? Do you see how, how I reason? First, you have to recognize, we, I'm very afraid that you look at it and you forget why this is the average. You, when you ask yourself, why is this a good formula for the average? I do that because I established the Riemann sum and I convert it to integration. You see, that's how all ideas work. In fact, a few days ago, I was uh, using such simple ideas to derive an entirely new formula that nobody of my students ever saw. You do that all the time, okay? So the answer is obviously it's one, why? Because this function near zero is equal to essentially one, right? Sine x over x, if, if the distance from zero is small, is essentially one, here is how I describe it, right? So um, it's essentially, sine x over x is one where x is very close to zero. And so the average will be essentially one, f of zero. Goodness him, you're getting it, right? And uh, next question, look at it, be careful, watch it carefully. Next question is, uh, I'm, taking, um, I'm taking the function tangent of five x over x, where x is not zero and five if x is zero. And I take the limit as of one over x uh, from minus h to h f of x dx. What is that limit? Let's be careful. What is that limit? Fast. We don't have too much time. Okay, James, thank you, but be careful. Look at, look at this carefully. Look at the interval. What is this thing? Does this express the average, this limit as it stands? Does this express the average or maybe something else? Okay, thank you, Nassim. Be careful here. Look at it again. All of you, look at it again.
Okay, Alan. Okay, Rachel, good. Let's uh, see this. Do you see what, uh, what the situation is? The, the interval is from minus h to h, so it's, it's of length. Of what length is it? It's of a, h minus minus h, it's 2h. So to be the average, I need to place a 2 on the bottom, right? I need to place a 2 on the bottom, now it's the average, do you see? And uh, I compensate by multiply, multiplying by two. Now the average uh, near zero must be five. So it's two times five. Do you understand? This here is the average of the function f near zero. If h is small, it's the average near zero. But uh, the function is essentially taking the value five near zero. And, and not everything is five, but many values are very close to five. So it's two, and because of this extra two, it's two times five. You see guys, we're always doing again and again, the same exact uh, exercise, right? Where we just modify, we recognize and we modify. Here is now another question. This one is slightly harder. Uh, D, uh, we have this function, e to the power of sine of six x over three x, when x is not equal to zero, zero otherwise. Be careful here. Is this function continuous? It's not continuous. Do you see that? At zero, it's not continuous. E to whatever power is not zero. And uh, here I want you to calculate limit as h goes to zero of one over h, integral from zero to three h, f of x dx. Yes? I want you to take this limit. Calculate fast. What is this limit? Uh, James, there is the, the average cannot, or whatever the value cannot be. Um, so maybe you are, you're close to the right solution, but X is meaningless. X is, there is no such thing as X. You agree? When I say X, it's like I'm saying, um, well, it, it, X refers to different values. It's not a precise, it's not a number. This limit, if it exists, must be a number. Very good, James. Beautiful. Very good. Now it's good, okay? So let's do it all together. Yes, Alan, wonderful. Now let's see what happens here, guys. So the limit as x goes to zero is e squared. You agree? It's e squared. Now what allows me to ignore zero? Look at it. The average involves uh, lots of numbers that are similar to e squared if, if, if there is very little room in between zero and three h. I sum up lots of values that are similar to e squared and average them. 
and there is one value that's zero. Now, why does the zero not matter? It's because, um, well, imagine that an Irishman goes to maybe China, right? So he, because it's a Irish tend to be very, very tall, his length, his altitude is, uh, his, uh, his size is not going to figure out very much uh, in China because, um, you know, there are a lot of people that are of different height, not as tall as the Irish. And uh, they, because there are so many of them, he's an outlier. He's not going to matter. Here in this limit, we have an infinity. We have an infinity, really, right? And so uh, infinity of values. So uh, we will have lots of values that are similar to E squared, infinitely many of them and only one zero. So it does not um, do anything. It's not uh, affected. It's, sorry, zero does not cause any, uh, any change in it. So the average here that we will obtain is, well, to make it an average, I have to have a three on the bottom. It's three times one over three H. And so I have three E squared. Good, do you understand? All right, so we are now moving to the next lecture, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So this theorem is partially explaining why you have no choice but to listen to my lectures and why I have no choice to talk about those lectures. Why? Because uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can recognize it in physics as one of those uh, very important results that are identical, mathematically equivalent to conservation of momentum. Or for example, when you have an interchange of um, kinetic energy and potential energy, the work energy theorem, it's a version of conservation, uh, it's a version of conservation of energy. Right, so those things, uh, they will imply if you believe in the uh, traditional mechanical uh, framework of physics, they imply that um, pretty much whatever happens now and whatever will happen and whatever has happened works pretty much like a clock. There is no free will. There is uh, this, this concept is entirely alien. Everything is predictable in theory at least uh, forever into the past and forever into the future. That is philosophically what the fundamental theorem of calculus implies in physics, okay? In classical physics, to be precise, right? There are other, of course, uh, other buts to add here. So here is uh, what this theorem is roughly saying. Are you ready, guys? So if I want to find antiderivative of cosine, well, I can just guess it. Antiderivative of cosine is sine or sine plus a constant, yes? But what about the antiderivative of a function like cosine of x squared or of e to the minus x squared? I can give you, let's say, um, I can give you a week to try to find it or a month or a year. And if you are not going to use the internet, uh, I am almost certain that the way you're going to proceed, you're not going to be successful. Why? Because uh, you can actually, it's a very complicated proof. You can prove that there, they have an antiderivative, but their antiderivative is not expressible as a finite combination of uh, your familiar functions of sine, cosine, exponential, logarithms, inverse, uh, inverse functions. It's not expressible. Those are very, very deep results to prove that they're not expressible, but you just take it for granted from me, okay? So in general, when you're dealing with integration, you worry that you are wasting your time because perhaps it could be that you are not clever enough to figure out the antiderivative or it could be that it, nobody can figure the antiderivative, that it simply does not exist. Yes? So here is a new type of function. And let's see if you understand that new type of function that's gonna work for us, okay? Uh, if we have a continuous function y equals to f of x, uh, we will call, um, capital F of X, uh, the integral from A to X F of T dt, and we call it the slice of cake function. Now, why do I call it the slice of cake function? Imagine that your favorite aunt, Aunt Jemima, bakes you a cake. 
And because you're in Calc 1, the cake is actually going to have only one dimension. But don't worry. Don't think of it as a very primitive cake because you, you take Calc 3 and it can be three-dimensional, four-dimensional, or higher, right? But you have a cake. And here is what's happening. So this little f is the crust of the cake. You see, this is my little f. It's the crust of the cake. And at the point A, Aunt Jemima makes a slice and then asks you, where else do you want to slice the cake? So if you're celebrating whatever um, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, or maybe Hanukkah, you now know that you're gonna be stuffed with very bad calories, right? So then of course, um, you want to make sure that you know how much cake you're eating. So mention this point X, mention this point X, and you get a particular slice of the cake. And uh, that integral measures how much cake you will be getting. Do you understand? It measures the area, and area of this cake is naturally proportional to the calories. So let's, under, let's see if you understand how that uh, function is working, right? So, uh, so let's say this, okay? Here is a comprehension check. Uh, you have some sort of uh, function, right? This is the cross function, and you, you say x equal to a. What have you asked Aunt Jemima to do for you? So if you say, oh, Aunt Jemima, I want X equal to a, a, equal to a, how much cake are you asking? What are you, what are you gonna get? This is now the slice. So the, the, the one slice was made at the point A and the other slice will be made at the point that you specify. So you specify X equal to A, how much cake do you get? Okay, great, no cake or zero cake. Very good, June, and very good, James. You get nothing, right? Now let's understand uh, what would happen if you say X equal to B, where B is smaller than A. What are you asking Aunt Jemima to do? And what should I do if you say X is equal to B, where B is less than A? What should I do as a responsible, I don't know, adult or whatever you like to call it, uh, watching you? and worrying about you. If you say X equals to B, and B is smaller than A, what are you asking Aunt Jemima to do? Um, aren't, aren't you take, so we know, so it's a length, right? So we know X is greater, you know X is greater than A, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that B is in between these two intervals, right, of points. Well, I, B is just a point. I'm just saying uh, there is a slice of the cake. You see here is, is A and you say, uh, you're asking for X to, for a B to be smaller than A. So you're asking for the cut to be here. What are you truly asking for, um, for from Al Jemima? Like half? No. Because how can I know half or what? No, it's just, it's just some arbitrary point. I just know that uh, you asked to slice the cake from below A. What, the, what are you truly asking in terms of this? If this is the function, what are you asking? It, it, it's basically nothing again. Mm -hmm. Is it? What about the rest of you guys? What are you asking and Jemima to do? No? If look at look at it, look what happens if I uh, select um, if I select B smaller than A. No, look at it. The integral from A to B, f of t dt, uh, with a minus will be equal to the integral from B to A. Now it's in the right order because B is smaller than A f of t dt, right? So if I, uh, um, so if I place, uh, one second, I, what am I writing here? So let me just correct it. So if you place b, right? If you place b, assuming that the crust is positive uh, and b is smaller than a, I can, I can put them in proper order. So b is here and a is here, and then I have to put a minus, right? f t, dt, which will make this, uh, if, if the crust is above the x-axis, 
then that will make this less than zero. So what you are asking is that you ask, Aunt Jemima, could you stick fingers in my throat so I vomit more cake, right? So you're bulimic. That's what it means. Do you understand? I don't think you do. All right, so now let's try to describe the precise relationship between the function f of x and capital F of x. So let's look at here, uh, f of x is equal to x and capital Fx integral from zero to x of t dt. Now I can do it geometrically. Look at it, I can do it geometrically. I have, if it's, if it's the t-axis, now I integrate from zero to x and I have this uh, um, curve which is t. So what am I getting? The profile of the cake is always a triangle. So this is a triangle of height x and of width x. And so this function actually can be written much simpler as one half x squared. Look at it. One half x squared, if you take the derivative, will give you x. Do you follow? So this complicated looking function is actually nothing more than one half x squared an antiderivative of x. Good? Now let's see the relationship if the function is x squared and uh, the, the capital F is integral from zero to x of t squared dt. What is the relationship for b? Uh, now if I carry out Riemann sums and I take the limit, I hope you know how to do that, I get one third x cubed. So in B, this can also be written simpler as one third x cubed. You see, you, you can just try carrying out those limits, you will get one third x cubed. What do you think will happen uh, if I uh, do the, pro the procedure for C? If I carry out the procedure for C, I will obtain, look at it, I, I carry out using Riemann sums, I obtain one quarter x to the power of four. So each time I do this process, I obtain a particular antiderivative of this function, of the, of the integrand, okay? Of the integrand. In D, it will be the same. If I carry out, I did it using Riemann sums to try to illustrate how that's supposed to work. You see, uh, you can practice it. This is not a coincidence. Do you understand what I, what I just verified? I just uh, conducted a bunch of experiments which I would have, if I had a lot of time, I would have given you the pleasure of uh, carrying yourselves. It's very useful, you know, when you carry it yourself, you realize, uh, well, great, I, I, this integral is actually representing an antiderivative. This Aunt Jemima function, this cake function, represents an antiderivative of the original curve. This now brings me to the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay? So here is what I'm going to show let little f be continuous, then the function defined by integral from a to x, notice I change uh, to a different letter, f of t dt, is an antiderivative. Well, I suppose she also makes k color. So this function will end up, uh, so any continuous function has an antiderivative which can be expressed using this uh, uh, cake function, cake area function, yes? That would be what? So, um, so if I take the derivative of this uh, capital F, I will get little f of x. Now let us examine why I know that to be the case and what's the intuition behind this theorem. If you understand that, that is amazing. That's, it's called fundamental theorem of calculus, not in vain. So, we always go to the definition. By definition of the derivative, f prime of x is just f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, which I can, if I want, write it as one over h and this in parentheses. Are you with me thus far? Now, what is the, this f of x plus h minus f of x? So that would be integral all the way to x plus h, and this would be integral all the way to x. And when I subtract, look what I obtain. I obtain one over h integral from x to x plus h. And I take limit as h goes to zero, f of t dt. 
And I recognize that this formula is the average. It is the average. I could actually do it in so many ways. Look at it. If, if uh, what this means, uh, build up many uh, thin rectangles from X to X plus H and add their area. But uh, if H is very small, those th thin rectangles may be replaced by just one thin rectangle because uh, there is really barely any distance, right? So this looks like a thin rectangle of height f of x and width h. So either you can think of it as the average, just this is just the average uh, where h goes to zero between x and x plus h, which will be, if the function is continuous, it will be f of x. It will not be this way if the function is not continuous. The average is always going with majority. Average is majority rule, right? It's just what happens if h is small, then uh, all the values uh, between x and x plus h are essentially the same like f of x. That's what I'm saying here. f of t is essentially f of x for all t between x and x plus h. Here is again a picture of what's happening, guys. Do you see? Integral between x and x plus h is very thin area. So if I zoom in uh, in that area, it, it almost looks like a rectangle. It almost looks like a rectangle here and here is just a zoom in. So to show you that it's not precisely a rectangle. So I might as well imagine that this integral is this elevation multiplied by this width, but I also divide by the width. So it will be just this elevation. Are you with me? What I just observed, if you understood it, what I just observed is that, uh, is that the derivative of this integral function is always the integrand function. Integrand, the function that I integrate. Okay, so, most people, when they take calculus, they don't understand this idea at all. And um, yes, let me show you first how that idea is useful in, uh, in, in generating that trick. Okay? Remember, we have this uh, integration shortcut trick. It's really the fundamental theorem of calculus that makes it possible. Here is how we do that. So guys, before I continue with my explanation, did you understand what I said so far? Right? Are you with me? Right? Do you understand the average? It's very vital to understand uh, how the average works and uh, then this integral. You can actually have so many pathways. We can describe them. So here is suppose that I need to integrate uh, from zero to three the function x squared dx. Okay, so here is what I do. Instead of calculating it at three, I create, my, I create, um, I create the cake function from zero to x. I actually, I, I, I make a step that, the step that makes it seem that I'm actually making the situation only more complicated. This used to be a number. Now I create the cake function. I realize that this is the cake function evaluated at a slice at three. The, the other cut was at three, you see? So simply the cake function uh, is this and the, this particular integral is evaluate the cake function at three. Are you following? So this integral is the cake function at three. Now, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I know something about the cake function. I know that if I take the derivative, I will get x squared, right? I will always get this uh, inner function replaced by x. If I take the derivative, it's x squared. What does it mean about the formula of the cake function? It means that uh, the cake function is an antiderivative of x squared. Do you agree? And, anti and we know all antiderivatives. We had this usual suspects. Do you remember usual suspects, guys? So I know Kaiser Sosa, in other words, my particular function, my integral function must be in this family. All antiderivatives are of the form one third x cubed plus constant, plus some constant, you agree? Because, uh, deriv anti because derivatives are just evaluating the position of slopes of the curve. So all antiderivatives, are curves built of line segments that must be parallel. So they must be parallel curves, which means uh, f of x is one third x cubed plus c. All I need to figure out is which particular antiderivative function do I have here. So instead of doing the integral, I see I can just write one third and the number cubed. If I just know, I, I know I can plug in the three. I just need to say one, one third, three cubed plus some number and that will give me the right area. I just need to figure out plus what number. So there is one value for which the cake function is always easy, right? Take this value and make it zero. 
You see, if x is equal to zero, the integral from zero to zero will be zero. You understand? If the top value is the same as the bottom value, remember, that means you're not cutting any cake. So this is what I do. At zero, the function is equal to zero. But if I plug zero, it's one third, zero cubed plus c, which is c. So c is equal to zero. I just figured out that my cake function is one third x cubed. So all I need to do is plug in three and I get my result, which is nine. Are you with me? Do you understand how I reasoned? I used uh, this idea that that integral function is actually one particular antiderivative. And if I have a simple formula for the antiderivatives of this function, I can uh, use the simple formula to replace the more complicated version of it, the integral. That's what I did here. So let me show you with one more example uh, how that idea works, okay? And uh, then we, uh, we do the general statement. Look at it, guys. Suppose that you need to integrate uh, from, let's say from uh, one, let's say from, uh, from pi over four to pi of uh, the function that I'm integrating is cosine x dx, yes? This is a very, very complicated uh, integral to do using Riemann sums. So here is what I do. I define, look at it. I define this function, capital F of X. I define to be the integral from pi over four to X of cosine T dt. And then I realize that uh, to evaluate what I want, I just need to plug in pi I just need to plug in pi into the function and that will give me uh, my desired answer. That will give me this. If I know the function, I just need to plug in pi. Are you with me so far? Yes? You're holding, you understand what I'm doing here, guys. You see, I, I actually create a function. Now, I know by the fundamental theorem of, uh, of calculus, I know something about this function. What do I know about it? What is the derivative of this function? Could anybody tell me? If I take the derivative of this integral function, what do I get? Write in the comments. You say you understand, or at least uh, some people shake their heads. Maybe you're clueless. What is the Oh, well, careful, careful. No, James. What's the derivative of this function? You see, you guys, you, you fail to understand the fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivative of this is always just replace this x instead of this t. So the answer is cosine x. It's cosine x. Yes? So what function uh, has derivative equal to cosine x, you see? So then I, I realized that this integral, this capital F of x, is what? 
this capital F of X must be what sort of function, what type? Can you find a simple formula for it or simpler looking formula for it? What function has derivative equal to cosine? Obviously, sine x plus some constant. I do not know what constant, yes? But look at it. If I plug in what value, this, this particular function is only easy to evaluate at pi over four. So if I plug in pi over four, if I plug in pi over four, I will get on one hand, I get zero. On the other hand, I get uh, sine pi over four plus C. Sine of pi over four is root, is root two over two. So, so okay, I will just keep it a sine of pi over four. I mean, I want to show you the pattern, okay? So what do I get? I see that uh, C is equal to minus sine of pi over four. Just solve this equation. Yeah, C is equal to minus sine of pi over four, which means my function, my, my, I, I now know everything about this function. It, so this integral, look at it, the integral from pi over four to X of, of cosine cosine T dt is equal to sine of x minus sine of pi over four, right? Which by the, and that means that the integral from pi over four to pi of cosine t dt is equal to sine of pi minus sine of pi over four which is simply sine x evaluated from pi over four to pi. That's the shortcut, do you see? That gives me the shortcut that I was claiming I should have. So, <clears throat> yes, I, I will, guys, I, I continue. If you have to leave for whichever reason, I'm continuing until I finish uh, this particular chapter. And it's up to you if you decide to stay or not, but I will go on. Okay. Professor, before we go, is there anything you should know about the final? Yes, uh, it's gonna be very hard and uh, you better know as much as you possibly can. Very, I don't think it's actually that hard, but uh, um, it is to avoid cheating more conceptual. Yes. It's going to be on the, we basically sign in on the website at like 6 p.m. And from there we'll be fine. You have to sign today and uh, I, I send the email, make sure you read it. I think the exam will take place, uh, you know, uh, from six one, to eight. Uh, the, I, th I, think, I think the way it is with the, this class, uh, there's, there's possible confusion there, but I think they made it, uh, you see, it, it's just one, uh, uh, one list. You see, I didn't set it up. There is one list. There is a, it's it's everybody together. So I'm expecting that it will be open from uh, from one to uh, from one to three, with half half an Almost. hour of um, yes, yeah, so one to three. Make sure, guys, one to three. Read my message, and if you cannot make it because of some conflict, uh, write to Professor Suzuki, and you have a makeup on Friday. You understand? It it says on the site that, um, or it said somewhere, like for the in Suzuki's emails, that yes, oh, it says right here, final exam. Yeah, but but that, the um, is the same. You understand that, that? So be careful. I mean, uh, it could be what you are saying, but my understanding is because I see only one list rather than two classes. I see only one list. You understand? It could be that uh, what happened is accidental. But uh, trust me, it's worse to try to correct for it. Okay. 
uh, I think every class received only one code. Maybe there should have been two codes, but they received only one code, which means it, you're it all- It says on the site here. right here for, for um, Monday and Wednesday evening, and like it, it tells us different times per class, <laughs> Tuesday and Thursday evening, it's at 6 to 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Yes. So it, it, for you, for your specifically, it says a different time? Yeah, it, it tells us each class. It says Monday, Wednesday evening, But Thursday, make sure on the Wednesday. website, because uh, make sure that, because you have, you, the final is slated for you, okay? So I will check what I can see. But when I opened it, I see, let's say, 66 or something students registered. They are all in one list, in one class, you see? So mm -hmm. my, my assumption is that uh, there was no differentiation between uh, you and morning students, right? Okay. Even if one was supposed to exist, because today I saw one of his messages that he, that yes, uh, that possibly the evening final should have been the evening final, but there is no differentiation, uh, you know, that I see there, which means the system might make it a uh, morning, uh, morning uh, exam. I will check again to see what I can see about it, but I have no control over it. Okay. okay. So, so are you saying uh, there's a chance we could probably just do it once at 3 p.m.? Uh, 1 to 3 p.m. Yes, if it's if it's listed as 1 to 3 p.m. It's better to just do it this way. If you cannot make it, send a message to Professor Suzuki to make a, um, to make up uh, on Friday. Okay, because maybe okay. My, my assumption gotcha. is maybe there was an error and you were all first. I thought that they just decided to take the exam for everybody. That's why I didn't deal with it. I was sure that they decided to have the uniform final. It was never this way previous semesters, right? Uniform final was always uh, in the right uh, time and, and uh, for, for only morning students. For evening students, it was a separate exam, right? So this semester, everybody takes the uniform final. So I assume that they didn't, didn't want any delay so that morning students could not help evening students or something like that, right? So, uh, but it could be that it was just uh, an error. But if, if you just make sure that as far as I know, right, the exam will take place uh, from one to uh, three. Right, as far as I know, and uh, maybe uh, if, if because you're all on the same list, but I'll check again, and if I find anything else, I will let you know. Good. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you, Professor. Have a good one. Sure, have a good one. Okay. So, guys, those that remained here, the few that remained here, uh, do you follow the material? Okay. So, in general. If you carry out this calculation, let's say capital F sub A is the antiderivative that I'm seeking, the very specific antiderivative. You see, if I want to integrate from A to B little f x dx, I can define I can define this particular integral function from A to x f of t dt, which by the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, its derivative will be just take this top x and plug it instead of the t. If you understood it, that's what happens. Good. So what do we get? We get uh, capital F sub A of X is equal to any other antiderivative I'm able to find plus a constant. If I'm able to find another antiderivative, they're all related by, uh, by a constant plus one, right? As soon as I find one antiderivative, every other antiderivative is the same thing plus some constant. Now I need this constant because I, I need to deal with a particular antiderivative. So what do I do? This um, capital F sub A is only easy to evaluate at the point A. So because if I plug A, it, it's, the, it's the integral from a number to itself, uh, which, is, uh, which is what? Which is zero, right? So we have zero equal to F A, uh, uh, capital F of A, which is equal to this function plus C. So C is equal to minus F A, which means uh, my integral function is any antiderivative minus the antiderivative at A, which means this integral gives me the shortcut, okay? Gives me that particular shortcut, okay? Uh, before I continue, Nassim, you have a, anything you wanted to, to ask me? Yeah, Professor. Uh, I text Professor Zazuki about the final. I said, I'm not gonna be able to take it Tuesday because I have a conflict with um, a chemistry exam in ecology. So he said he could move it to me to Friday, but I have to let you know that I'm gonna take it on Friday. Yes, yes, uh, that's what I said. You just I let, text you let, an email. Oh, by, by CCing, you understand? You can email directly because you might say, uh, if you have a conflict, I don't mind, I approve as it is. But 
yeah good so so yes i emailed you yeah. earlier i but i don't know if you received my email or not i did i did uh, i've seen your email so that's fine with me just what i'm saying is uh, if you guys uh, send this message always just cc me and that and that's done all right onwards all right. yes what is it and then there were seven all right so here are some questions guys let's see if you can figure it out uh, so solve you have to find antiderivative so a b c and d please uh, do it fast let's do a what's the what's the answer here for a Okay, Minkowski, so uh, sine x plus a constant, yes? Sine x plus a constant, wonderful, wonderful. Now uh, let's try the more difficult one, integral from of e to the minus x squared dx. Let's see how you will deal with this one. Okay. No, incorrect. So anyone who posted, it's incorrect. Mm -hmm. So once I taught, I taught uh, calculus and I had an exam on integration and most students did whatever they did, but one student, he understood, uh, understood uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, and did the following. In some cases, you will not be successful in finding a, a nicer formula. So I can, for instance, decide to, uh, to say it's the integral from zero to X of E to the minus T squared DT plus a constant. Why? Because by the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, this will be the, to the, the totality of all antiderivatives. It just, I do not have a nice expression for them, but I don't always have a nice expression for them. You understand? This could have been also done uh, for the previous problem. So I could have written zero to X cosine TDT plus C. It just, um, it's nicer to write sine of X plus C, but that is working perfectly well. Now, the others are very similar. Let's say this I can write as the integral, say, from 1 to v of uh, tangent inverse, I can replace the v by t. And uh, here I can do the same with u. Okay? And then we're almost there, guys. Uh, here, is, um, here is your task here. Now take the derivative of a, please. What's the derivative? Um, so, Professor? Yes? Um, 
is this supposed to help us like um, finding the answer to a derivative easier? Uh, well, this, what, what, what is this exercise about? Yeah, basically. Well, it, it, to recognize the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's what it is about, you see. So it's called fundamental for, for a very good reason. So, hmm. right, so the question is, what's the derivative of this integral from one to x to the four of secant t dt? What's the derivative? And if we do it the normal way, we'll find the area, but we want to keep the sec t. And well, do, if and you do, what is the normal way? What, what do you mean by normal way? Like you take the antiderivative of um, secant of t dt, yeah. and but then you'll find the... your energy, right? You're 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 going up, and then you're going down. It's like it's like to stay in the same place. You're gonna run up the stairs in the in the in a skyscraper, and then down the stairs. What for? And sometimes you will not be able to uh, carry this out, right? So mm -hmm. here is what happens. Uh, uh, the, the, the derivative of functions where this is the integral, where this is the integral, uh, okay, Nassim, that's good, except you, you replace t, uh, uh, it's x to the four rather than that, right? So here is what, what's gonna happen, guys. Uh, so derivatives of all functions where this is the power, Professor, I actually get confused all the time between the T and the X. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I will, uh, in below, below, if you're interested in the explanation, I, I, can, I also explain why I switched to a T, right? So oh, the derivative here ends up being this. What you do is you plug in into the integrand, you plug in X to the four, and you multiply by the derivative of X to the four by four X cubed, you're done. That's the derivative. You just take the top number, plug it instead of the t, and multiply by the derivative of the top number. Yes? Let's see if you understand that. Go ahead and please uh, calculate the derivative in b. What's the answer? There might be, we, we will look at, um, at the exam questions, I think, what, we have Monday and we have uh, maybe the weekend uh, to have another review. Professor, how many questions will be in the final? I don't know, but oh. not, uh, not fewer than uh, you see in the review, but mm -hmm. expect, um, expect an exam that will be difficult. That's what you should always expect, right? That's what you train for. Um, I do not know what the, I never saw the exam. I have no idea what it's, what it will look like. I imagine it's, it's a similar set of problems to the review list. Okay. Well, Christian, what's the derivative of this function? You just simply plug in the X. So it's one over X cubed plus one on the bottom, right? Good. So it's this, that's how it works. You see, uh, that's the derivative of those integrals. That's why they were built is that it's just the integrand at X. Good. Now calculate C please. Wait, so wait, wait, wait. So this, there's no, there's no one half or no. No, well, that, that's the point. Uh, you see, uh, ask yourself or try to examine how the integration is differentiated, how the integral function is differentiated, right? So what we did, we saw, well, that's how the fundamental theorem of calculus is telling you this. If you want to know what's the antiderivative of the function f of x, if it's continuous, if it's continuous, then I can simply write, and I can show you why continuity matters again, right? Then you can simply write some point a all the way to x, f of t dt and define that to be your capital f of x. Why do you define it to be this way? Because by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of this function ends up being the same as taking the, uh, the variable and plugging in, into, to, into the integrand, into the integrand, sorry, not uh, t, but okay. x. So that's the result.
Now, it should not be arbitrary because if it's arbitrary, guys, then you forget. You don't understand why that uh, means anything. I'm just hurrying to try to capture this information. So what is now the uh, answer for C? Okay, uh, except you made a small mistake, Nassim. And uh, yeah, so, so you see, look at it, the variable has to be on the top. So if you see the variable not on the top, what do you do first? You say, uh, before you take the derivative, you say it's minus the integral from pi to x root one plus secant t dt, right? You make it look like the previous example. So now you have the x on the top. You see, again, pattern, same thing. So the derivative is root one plus uh, secant x. And because there is a minus, you just multiply by minus. Good. Continue with d. d. More of you should participate. If something is not clear, you let me know what. Yes, it's because we switch the x and pi, right? We want x to be, we want the variable to be always on the top and we want to have a constant, a number that doesn't change on the bottom. Christian, uh, be careful, look at it. It's chain rule. Because it's not X, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's this uh, new function, new type of function, the Anjamaima function or the cake function that has eaten sign. So that must involve chain rule. Look at it, there is a sign here on the bottom. What, what, what happens here for D? Rachel, you're there. So what's going on?
Não vou tirar, bom. Almost Nassim, you're 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 still forgetting its chain rule. You see when when you uh, what should you be doing here? Yes, now it's good. Look at it carefully, guys. What's happening in D? I first need to reverse it. You see, why is that obvious to me? Because uh, I know how to take derivatives of uh, this type of function. Right? Then I replace the T. So, uh, so what happens is, so this is my capital FX. What I have here is sine. So that's the same as uh, composition. So it's chain rule. Yes? It's, uh, it's the uh, integral function that has swallowed another familiar function. It's just chain rule. So what happens is that I first uh, make the sign the top. And then when I take the derivative, I replace the T by sine and I multiply by the derivative of the top function by cosine. Now, uh, one of the last challenges, what about, uh, what about E? How do you do E? Okay, uh, uh, careful. Look at it. You have to make it look like uh, like a constant on the bottom and a variable on the top.
Okay, Nassim, uh, uh, careful. What can Wait. you do, look at? Yes. So, so both of them, both of them are sine x and cosine x, right? Even if I flip it, right, it's still gonna. If I flip it, right, let's say I make this whole problem into a negative, it will still be cosine of x on the yes, top and yes, sine on the bottom. Help. Flipping would not help. Okay. So what would help? It's an integral, right? So what can you do with an integral? Uh, okay, I'm scrolling down. Well, you can always introduce a constant. Uh, it could be in between or after, right? So break it apart into cosine to constant, constant to sine, and then uh, uh, do the flipping. Yes, you see it, James, right? That's how it is, right? So just it, you have to separate the integrals. Um, yes, that's right, uh, Nassim. Now it's right. Okay. So then you take the derivative, look what happens. You plug in sine, multiply by cosine, and there is a minus here. Uh, and so that you just plug in cosine, the derivative uh, of cosine is minus sine. So minus and minus becomes plus. But here is the general situation. Do you see guys? If I have a function ax and a function bx, I just, uh, when I take the derivative, I plug in bx times b prime minus uh, ax a prime. When I when I separate and flip, I see that that must be the formula that I obtain. Does it make sense? You separate okay. and and, uh, and you see. Look at it. Just uh, you can replace it. You put a constant. It doesn't they look, the constant doesn't even have to be in between a and b. It can be any number. Integral always uh, always splits around that number. So uh, then what you have is um, then you then this minus here is because of the flip, right? This minus here is because you make a the top. Good, that's the formula for the derivative then. So let's see if you can do it fast uh, for f. What's the derivative uh, for f? Um, negative, um, hey, professor, I gotta go. All right, Christian, uh, good that you held so long. Thank you for the semester. Well, it's not over yet, right? you want to say like that sure <laughs> you're hiding what what's what's going on i'm here it's just uh my room's a mess ah, i don't care i mean uh, maybe the others either, you know but it's good to see you <clears throat> yeah i i my plan is really to keep all of you forever I, i'm gonna do that with probability right not right so you know we continue. I mean, I don't mind. I honestly don't mind. I, I love learning math. It's just uh, I'm pre-med. <laughs> yes, well, uh, that was in the past. We are looking uh, forward in the future, right? Which is now a pre-PhD. Right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, right? The math and technology, why not? Right. That's true. No, we'll see. So you, you'll be busy over this, right? You, over the winter or whatnot, right? You have lots of things to do. Um, I've taken a class, yeah, in the winter. Uh, and then I, I, I'm planning on taking classes in the summer. Yeah, a lot, a lot of work. Well, go rest. It's nice uh, seeing you. Good I don't luck have with any everything. other option. I'll take uh, Calc two with you. I'm not teaching Calc two, uh, at least not here. Uh, but you can, if you if you need to, I uh, will help you with it. Okay. So next semester, I'm teaching again Calc one, two sections, and probability theory. If you're interested in probability theory, uh, you're welcome to join the class. All right. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. I won't fail you on the final. All right. Well, hopefully I won't fail you on the final. <laughs> Don't make me blush. <laughs> <laughs>
Good night, Professor. Good night. All right, are we ready? So the derivative, you're tired, I know. It's, uh, it's a lot of material, I'm sorry for that, uh, for in one, uh, in one day. It's like we are competing uh, at Nathan's, how many hot dogs can we eat, right? How many mathematical dog dogs, hot, hot dogs can we eat? <laughs> right, right, James, right? So here what we do, we plug in x cubed, so it's e to the minus uh, x cubed squared multiplied by the derivative of x cubed which is three oh my god squared minus the same thing as minus uh, uh, x squared times the derivative of x which is one so that's the answer right yeah. I, will, I will leave you this guys you see look look how nice is this right look at it it's the integral of an integral but uh, i will leave it for you to uh, think about it because I think you're tired. And one other thing about this, uh, you see, I, I have, a, I, I explain, Nassim, why do we change parameters? Why do I not just simply write integral from a to x, f of x dx, why do I change it to some other letter? Okay, so I plan, I, I will see how many people will join because uh, maybe it's not useful to you. But uh, I, I plan to uh, do a review over the weekend and another review on Monday, I presume, right? So that to try to cover what's on the exam and as best as we can prepare you for what's happening. So uh, okay, so professor, what time is going to be the review? Uh, I will I will message uh, over the uh, weekend, right? Uh, I I, pr I presume on Sunday. And on Monday, I will do a review, but- uh, can, it, can it be uh, like an evening after four or five, four, because yeah, I'd be in work in the morning. Day? For, for Monday? Afternoon. Yeah, because I'd be in work. I live at around five o'clock. At around five o'clock you live, yes? Yeah. Um, Sometimes I try to attend, but I'd be in work, so- What I'd about Sunday? Like trying to what about Sunday? It's okay, Sunday I'll be in home. I will take okay, it. We'll, 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 I, I will record it anyhow. <laughs> I cannot promise uh, I would have done it at the time you ask, but I, uh, you know, we'll see if I, uh, because I, I, with probability I also need to deal with them. And, I, and they usually have a class on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I told them that semester will never be over. So we'll continue with probability. Right? All right, so Professor, we're still going to have a second exam, yeah? Uh, no, you can consider that you already did it and you got 100 on it. So just survive the final. Okay. I thank you, Professor. Okay, I'm stopping thank the recording, you. guys, and uh, good luck.